Well, it's great to be here. I'm, I'm honored to be on the program. Uh, it's gr just gratifying to see everyone uh, turn out for this, and uh, I, ho I hope this uh, event is going to be the big success that it seems to, seems to be uh, here at the beginning. So, uh, wonderful, wonderful to be here. Uh, the time is short, so I, need, I have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So, uh, if I seem to skip over topics that could uh, deserve their own treatment, you'll understand why. <clears throat> And I'll try to leave some time for questions as well. Uh, the title is, you know, individual sovereignty. Is it a radical idea? And by individual sovereignty, I don't mean anything deeply metaphysical. I really just mean freedom in sort of the everyday political sense, being, being able to live the kind of life you want, uh, respecting other people's rights, of course, but otherwise being, being left alone. So I don't even have any special meaning uh, for that. And I'm going to give sort of a lawyer's answer to the question uh, is it a radical idea? Namely, yes and no. And, uh, and now I will uh, go, on, and I'm not a lawyer, so um, I guess I could be prosecuted for practicing without a license in any state in, this, in the great union, or as, as Mencken called it, in the land of the theoretically free, <laughs> which uh, actually goes to my topic. <clears throat> so let me start with uh, no. No, that it's not a radical idea. Uh, and I, I know we could argue about this point too, so I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, but I, I, I intuit that I'm generally right, but I know a counter-argument can be made. I know for a fact a counter-argument can be made because I had the argument over breakfast, and, uh, which taught me the lesson that at, at breakfast never talk about your, to your upcoming talk because it'll throw you, you think you're well prepared and then you, you're totally going to start over because <laughs> someone at breakfast says, well, you know, there's a problem with that. And so uh, I'm going to pretend that breakfast never happened. So the, the reason for saying no, it's not a radical idea is, is, is a very simple one that's occurred to everybody, I'm sure. Most people, most children grow up being told by their parents, you know, don't hit your brother, your sister, or other people, your friends. Don't take their stuff without permission. And, and don't lie or keep your promises. And you can kind of see, you can see the parallels to don't aggress, right? Don't kill or don't hit or torture. Uh, don't, uh, uh, take, don't steal, don't take people's things, and keep your contracts. So, you know, it may not be a perfect one-to-one, -one, but it's, it's in the ballpark. And most people do absorb that lesson, uh, I think. Uh, that doesn't mean they abide by it all the time, but they have a sense that something's wrong when they uh, don't uh, uh, go by those principles. And I think they do generally carry them into adulthood, and people generally don't go next door to their next-door neighbor with a gun or or even a gun in their pocket, you know, not maybe pulled out, but like this, saying, you know, give me your money, I want to do some good things with it, or I need it more than you need it, or, or give me your house in the name of eminent domain, I want your house because uh, I have a more, you know, a higher and a better use for it. People don't think to do those things. They, I think they would realize that they are, it's wrong to do that. And I don't think it's just because they know the police will come and arrest them. I really do think that they, most people don't do that because it's not consistent with the image that they have for how it's proper to live with other people. I mean, I really do. Whether it's religion motivated, motivated by religion or, or some secular moral reason or just it's a, it's a, a taboo they've absorbed over, you know, they've accepted over, over the course of their life. They just think that's not how you live with other people. If they're leaving you alone, you kind of leave them alone. So that's why I say libertarian ideas are, uh, in that sense, not radical. And you know, if you think of it this way, uh, and if, you, if, you, if I've convinced you or if you already believe this, it in a way makes our job seem a little bit easier. Uh, that will sound funny, but uh, because it means all we need to do is convince people to be consistent, to apply it across the board, because, uh, because they're not. They're not consistent. Uh, Sam, Sam Konkin uh, has a quote to this effect. He says, the basic principle which leads a libertarian from statism to his free society is the same uh, which the founders of libertarianism used to discover the theory itself. The principle is consistency. The most crucial activity of the libertarian theorist, theorist is to expose inconsistencies. It's kind of a Socratic uh, mission, right? You show people they're holding two ideas that don't really fit, and you, you try to show them why they can't continue to hold two, and you hope they jettison the bad, the bad one and keep the good one. Although sometimes they go the other way, don't they? They throw out the good one. Um, okay, so that's, that's my very brief maybe perhaps controversial, hope not case, for why freedom is not a radical idea. Now, the yes part of this is that people see the political realm as having a whole different set of rules. 
what they would never think they could do, they don't uh, think is wrong when the state does it, when, when, or, quote, when we all do it, you know, democratically through government. Uh, and so they, there's a different set of rules. They see it as two different contexts. And uh, our job, uh, echoing Konkin, is to show them that there's no, that's an artificial division. Right? If it's wrong in this realm, it's wrong in that realm. So we have to show them the inconsistency. But, the, but for people, for a lot of people, uh, government is sort of a moral uh, alchemist, right? It can turn the, good in, the bad into the good. I think of it more as a sort of moral money laundering, right? <laughs> Things you might want to do, but you would never think to do if you launder it through the state, just like money being laundered through some organization, then it comes out good. You can, it can, you can, you can do it vicariously by having uh, politicians uh, do it. So th the rules are different with government. So they don't see taxation as theft. Uh, they don't see eminent domain as, as land, a land grab. They don't see conscription uh, as, uh, you know, as, as uh, slavery, although uh, we've gotten to the point, luckily, that even if the state outright has slavery, allows slavery, people generally see that as wrong. That's been one of the uh, uh, bits of progress uh, we've made over the, over the years. <clears throat> Uh, and so why do people see it as different? Well, that, that, that again could be a whole lecture, it could be a dozen books. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons. They have, people have a lot of answers for why the state can do things that you and I can't do individually. Uh, the sum total of those reasons I think of as political theory, I mean, basically, right? It's a big justification for why government can kill, steal, and do all the other things, torture, uh, or if not torture, waterboard uh, as a way of uh, uh, things that you yourself uh, could never do. Uh, I mean, they have lot, lots of fancy theories have been devised, uh, tacit consent uh, and uh, democratic uh, uh, authorization of the fact that we have all done this means, it means it's okay. Uh, these have all, I believe, been answered, have been demolished, and I, and I, don't, I won't spend time uh, on uh, uh, giving uh, refutations for that. I don't, I don't think they hold up. You can find lots of stuff uh, on this. Uh, you know, just do some search or email me and I'll send you some, some ideas. I do want to look at history. I want to spend more time uh, doing some history here <clears throat> because I, I, want to, I want to show that historically in the political history of the United States, we can also see that, that freedom uh, was and, and remains a radical idea. And by that I mean freedom, very, if you go down the deep down level of American history, Amer the founding uh, and then the political events that have occurred since then, freedom, while I'm not saying it, had no, played no role whatsoever, ideas of freedom, it was still foreign to the fundamental idea. And, I, and I'll try to flesh that out. Um, we all grow up learning that um, uh, the United States was founded on ideas of freedom, the founding fathers were devoted to freedom, and uh, everything that happened was fur in furtherance of freedom, right, the uh, adoption of the Constitution, uh, and then everything else that, that went on. And libertarians generally uh, pass on this, uh, this uh, uh, I think, uh, way oversimplified um, story of American uh, history. And I really think it's a problem that we do this because, number one, we, we do uh, risk alienating uh, potential uh, adherence to our philosophy because if they hear your oversimplified and, in, in many cases, outright wrong uh, story of history and then they come across a more accurate uh, version, they will say, well, what was that so-called libertarian telling me? He didn't know what he was talking about. So he can then totally sweep you aside because you've given him this, uh, this uh, way oversimplified uh, um, story of how uh, uh, you know, the United States was founded and then developed. So I, I want to do a little revisionist history, which is a honor, very honorable activity among libertarians and other people critical of the state because the, the, the state, the people who populate the state, do have an interest and they have, of course, they use the schools to great advantage for this, to uh, sell a particular story, narrative, about the country that serves the interest of people in power, not surprisingly. And uh, it, it, so it's uh, to our benefit to break that down, to uh, find out what a more accurate uh, historical narrative is, and to write about that and talk about that and otherwise uh, let other people know about it so they will begin to see that the, uh, this story that they've gotten from official sources uh, has severe problems in it and that it serves the interests of power. And it's all part of the same mission of trying to delegitimate uh, power, which I think is our, our great mission here. <clears throat> so, you know, sometimes see libertarians talking about a golden age, uh, 
uh, early 19th century, if only we could restore, and we often talk about restoring freedom. I hate that word. Okay? My attitude is the, the, the good old days lie ahead of us. Okay, they're, not back, they're not back there. <laughs> um, you know, the golden age, if you, depending on when you pick it, that the first half of the 19th century wasn't so great for uh, lots of segments of the population, a lot of people. Not just the most obvious, namely African Americans who were chattel slaves or women who didn't have uh, r r rights regarding property and contract and things like that, but, but even for uh, uh, lots of white males who uh, didn't own a lot of property, there, you know, I wouldn't exactly call it a golden age. Now, if you press a libertarian on that, he may give that up and uh, acknowledge that, okay, from 1800 to uh, 1870 was not the golden age. But then they just, tr they just pick it up and change it to, say, 1870 to, you know, the election of uh, Woodrow Wilson or uh, Teddy Roosevelt, so up to the progressive era, let's say, the end of, let's say, 1900. So 1870 uh, to uh, 1900, or maybe a few years earlier, 1887, when the Interstate Commerce Commission comes in, that's the new golden age, okay, 1870 to 1877. But uh, there's lots of uh, good reasons to question that. If you read uh, a book that everybody in this room should read if they haven't read it already, uh, and you may even be back one of those tables. Arthur E. Kirch's The Decline of American Liberalism. Please read that book. E. Kirch was a great historian, a man with uh, great libertarian sympathies, who did a marvelous book in the 50s about, on the, the broad sweep of American history from the beginning up till, uh, for, you know, when he stops basically up to his own time. Uh, and in great detail, um, shows you that um, you know, you can't, it, it wasn't, there wasn't a golden age beginning in 1870 either. And, you know, libertarians ought to be suspicious of this uh, golden age beginning in 1870 because we also like to use Randolph Bourne, uh, Bourne's Im uh, immortal phrase, uh, war is the health of the state, which I think we should, you know, all have them blazoned somewhere that we see it every day and then constantly cite it to other people. Now, if war is the health of the state, as I recall, there was a rather big war in the United States in the middle of the 19th century, a little past the midpoint, right? 1861 to 65. Uh, and the president had been elected in 1860 who was an advocate of the old Henry Clay American plan, which was a big government, central banking, income tax, uh, internal improvements, did I miss anything? High tariff plan. Uh, and so you get war plus a pre-war plan to build up the central government, and we're to think that from 1870 to 1888 or 1887 was somehow some sort of libertarian paradise? I mean, that doesn't make sense. Something doesn't add up there. So we need to take a closer look, and if you look at E. Kirch on this, uh, he does take a closer look, and you'll get some good, very good clues. Uh, we can go back further. We can look at the, uh, I should stick mostly with the U.S., mainly because time is short, but. But you can look at what happened in England. You can, we, we need to revise our view of the Industrial Revolution because we tend to think that that was a pro-freedom economic revolution where laissez-faire suddenly supplants mercantilism and, and, and things are generally really good, economically speaking. Well, there's been a lot of revisionist uh, history on this that goes way back. Uh, uh, I, I recommend you all take a look at Albert J. Knox's book, uh, Our Enemy the State, a very a very good book, but he's got a lot to say about this. And in our time, uh, you can read works by, uh, or lots of articles by um, Kevin Carson and other people on how the Industrial Revolution was, was very severely tainted in England by land distribution, beginning under the Tudors, but, but, but going in, even into the 19th century, the various kinds of enclosure acts, and where uh, the peasants, uh, who were the Lockean owners, in other words, if you believe generally in Locke's view that the, uh, the, uh, if you transform a piece of land that you then, uh, that's unowned at that point, then you become the owner of it, uh, the, the, the people who would have been the Lockean owners, the tillers of the soil for many generations, were uh, kicked off the land, or if not kicked off the land, were told you're now a tenant and you have to pay rent to me. Why? Because the king gave me this, this huge plot of land. This is now mine. And it, you thought it was yours, but it's not yours anymore. So if you want to stay, I'm, I'm, I, get a, I'm, I get a take, a big take of it. Or sometimes it just got kicked off altogether. Uh, Mises, and then, so you ended up with huge land uh, owners uh, uh, in England, and this also is true of, say, Latin America. It's a little different, the story's a little different in the United States. 
But uh, we have a very interesting uh, quotation from Mises, if I can find it, from, uh, uh, from Socialism, his book Socialism, where he says, nowhere at no time has large-scale ownership of land come into being through the working of economic forces in the market. It is the result of military and political effort founded by violence. It has been upheld by violence and violence alone. So where you see these really big estate, these huge plots, uh, plots that probably too, seems too small, huge areas of land under a single owner, uh, there's, a, there's going to be a political source to that if you look uh, closer, or, or outright military conquest uh, to that. It's, uh, that doesn't arise on the market. And so this, uh, this, under, this undergirds the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution is not an outbreak of just free, suddenly you know, free markets with, with Lockean owners and, and the, the kind of the society that we uh, envision. It was... Uh, it, it, it was rigged. It was rigged from the beginning. You find, and you'll see this in Nock. You'll see it in, in somebody who inspired Nock, uh, Franz Oppenheimer, who wrote a very good book called The State, which I, I recommend to you. Uh, and then in addition to that, you get the English uh, passing other laws like the, uh, the laws of settlement that, reg that actually regulated the movement of workers. They couldn't just simply go around looking for the best uh, employment situation. They were controlled in how they could move around. Uh, Adam Smith decries this in The, in the Wealth of Nations. Um, the whole aim is that the employer class was looking for a way to cut off options from uh, uh, the, uh, the former you know, farming uh, uh, population uh, to keep them from being able to work for themselves. Because the idea was if they work for themselves, then they won't work for us. So there was another rigging of the game. Uh, there was a British writer in the early 19th century, E.G. Wakefield, who said, where land is cheap and all men are free, where everyone who so pleases can obtain a piece of land for himself, not only is labor very dear, as respects the laborer's share of the product, but the difficulty is to, is to obtain combined labor at any price. In other words, the employers were going to have a hard time getting employees if they had these other options of self-employment, of land ownership, and uh, you know, another, other ways out. The idea was to close off the other ways out. So they had to come and work in the, in the factories. It was, it was a rigged game. That's, that's the point I want to make. So coming to the US now, it's not exactly the same thing. We, don't have the, uh, we didn't have the same situation as England. But we do have the government distrib distributing an awful lot of land. First, first the royal uh, states, the royal um, governments of the colonies are, are giving land to cronies and friends, and you have lots of land speculation. Then after the country begins, you have uh, the government giving huge amounts of land to the railroads, and it's, it's the best land. And not only do they get the strip for the track, they get 15 miles on either side. And that's where the economic activity is obviously, obviously going to take place because that's where the railroad is. And uh, uh, the, um, the homestead, we always attach a lot of weight to the Homestead Act of uh, 1862, but it, it was not the sort of radical move to get land into, into people's hands that it sometimes uh, seems to be. And you can find uh, lots about this uh, in, the, in the literature. Uh, there's some articles I can recommend. I don't have the citations right with me. <clears throat> Uh, speaking of railroads, it's worth pointing out, we've got a Freeman article coming up on this from Kevin Carson, the government has been, uh, mostly the federal, but the states too, very heavily involved in all forms of transportation from the very beginning, right? Canals, railroads, uh, and then uh, the interstate uh, highway system, civil air aviation. The government has been substantially involved at all stages, and this has had very uh, formative effects on the U.S. economy. When we think of the U.S. economy as a big national economy because it's all tied together by, uh, by ro a railroad and then by uh, roads, interstate roads, and, and uh, air airplanes. Uh, and, uh, but the government was always involved in that. And what Carson argues, and I think it's a very good point that's underappreciated, is that this had a huge bias effect on business the business model that, de that evolved in the United States. It obviously subsidized the big national business model of national manufacturing, national distribution, the thinking in terms of the so-called national market, because the costs of moving goods was socialized, right? You didn't have to recover that cost in the product. Be why? Because the taxpayers were taxed to build that infrastructure. And so obviously, your, mo your model, if your model depends on I uh, uh, national movement of goods and services, you're going to get more of a benefit from that from some regional manufacturer, right, and distributor who doesn't rely so much, or maybe not at all, on national, the national uh, movement of, of goods. And so there's a bias, there's a subsidy toward a particular 
business model to the detriment of competing models. And we don't know, frankly, how things would have looked had this all just been left to the market, had no cost been socialized. But you can't socialize cost on this scale and not expect huge uh, effects. And yet, of course, those effects aren't really visible as effects, right? There aren't little signs on there saying this is the result of subsidy. So we just take that as, and since we believe we generally have had a free market uh, since the American Revolution, we think, OK, this is the way markets evolve. This is it. This is good. This must be good. We get lower cost. Look at this. We have Walmart moving goods. And, and yet, we don't know if there would be a Walmart exactly this way. No, we don't know what entrepreneurs would have uh, come up with in the case of a truly free market in education, uh, sorry, transportation. We just don't know, and so we can't say what things would have looked like. But we do know what has caused what we have today. And as economists and historians, we can say these subsidies were huge, and we, it's just nonsense to say, well, the consequences are minor. Things would have looked generally the same without those subsidies. There's just no grounds, I don't believe, uh, for saying that. Uh, you can find more of this kind of thing in E. Kirch, uh, not quite as much detail. And another person I recommend that you read on this to show you how interventionist government was throughout American history in, uh, uh, at the state level and then local level and then increasingly then at the national level is Jonathan Hughes's book, Jonathan R. T. Hughes, The Governmental Habit. I think that's a book that's way underappreciated by libertarians. He was a libertarian. I met him uh, at one point in the 80s maybe and he he considered himself a libertarian. He's, he passed away. Uh, but he wrote this very important book. By the way, he was a uh, professor of, uh, of um, Robert Higgs, just to make a connection there. Uh, he wrote this book, The Governmental Habit, which he then revised, and he called The Governmental Habit Redux. And he, he details how interventionist the states, the local governments, were in, in terms of price controls, licensing, things that we don't think of. We think there, was, there tended to be laissez-faire until you know, then you name your time. Some people will say until Lincoln, some people will say until uh, Wilson, and then some people will say until Roosevelt. It depends on what you want to do it. But Hughes addresses that. Hughes says, let me just read a quotation from, quotation from Hughes. Most studies of modern non-market controls consider that the relevant history extends back to the New Deal. If you go back further into the late 19th century, but in, but in fact, the powerful and continuous, and he stresses, continuous habit of non-market control in our economy reaches back for centuries. Thus, during the colonial period, virtually, virtually every aspect of economic life was subject to non-market controls. Some of this tradition would not survive. Some would become even more powerful, while some would ascend to the level of, the, of federal control. The colonial background was like an institutional gene pool. Most of the colonial institutions and practices live on today in some form, and there is very little in the way of non-market control that does not have a colonial or English forerunner. American history did not begin in 1776. That's Hughes. Okay, let's look at, that's kind of economics. Let's look at political events. Uh, one of the fairy tales that uh, we, we all grow up with, and libertarians, unfortunately, too many of them uh, propagate, is the idea that the Constitution was a great move toward freedom and toward uh, confining the power of the state. And you can find lots of articles currently, you know, being written today that uh, basically um, uh, push this line. And I think, it, I think it doesn't help our cause. Number one, it's, it's, it's historically accurate, inaccurate. And like I say, you'll, you potentially uh, alienate people when they come across something closer to the truth. They'll say, well, what was I being, being told? Um, I mean, there's no way you can look, judge the Constitution without first looking at the Articles of Confederation which people hardly ever do. They're, they're forgotten. They're forgotten even by most libertarians. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying the Articles of Confederation were great. Uh, even for me, it's too much government. And the states were, like, as you saw from Hughes, the states were not uh, uh, Bastian, uh, Bas uh, bastions of, uh, of laissez-faire. So, uh, so uh, you know, I'm not praising the time of the Articles of Confederation, but I am making sort of a comparative point. You know, if we went from the British monarchy to the Constitution, you might say, well, okay, that was maybe a small step forward. Uh, the, the king had a lot of arbitrary power. There's, there's a heck of, there's a, I, would, I'll, I don't mind saying there was, there's less arbitrary power uh, allowed for in the Constitution. It doesn't mean people can't figure out a way to do it, but they, I don't think the founders liked the idea of arbitrary power. They had an experience with the king. Uh, so, okay, you could maybe make a case it was a half step, a quarter step, you know, we can argue over how big a step it was. 
uh, on the road to freedom. But as soon as you drop in the Articles of Confederation beforehand, suddenly it looks like a big government move in the political game. That changes everything. There's no way you can look at it without what came before. And of course, you also need to look at the, the revolution itself and the debate, debates that went on before the revolution actually breaks out or, or, it's, or in full force. I mean, you have fights within the Continental Congress between the conservatives and radicals. The radicals wanted uh, to break from the uh, English. They were radical Democrats in their states because the, every state had its own aristocracy, which was the result of uh, favors of colonial uh, governments and royal, royal governors. And so you had, you had uh, solidifying elites in each of the states, and you had radicals who were rebelling against it, radicals who were uh, libertarians, uh, more or less. Even though they were, quote, Democrats, they were Democrats because they didn't like an aristocracy that was uh, frozen in place and, and uh, had all kinds of advantages over common people. So it was an anti-aristocratic dem uh, democracy. I know democracy sometimes has a bad name among libertarians, but I think context is extremely important. If it's an anti-aristocracy uh, uh, democracy, I'm probably going to find myself on that side. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the conservatives didn't want to break from England. Finally, when they realized that was inevitable, they wanted to make sure there was a strong central government in the new country. They wanted to recreate the British mercantile system in, in the new United States, and they wanted to de-emphasize the states. They wanted to make the states basically counties of the national government, and they wanted a strong central government. They didn't get their way at first. The Articles were, uh, got through the, uh, uh, the Continental Congress uh, at the hands of the radicals, and it created a very weak quasi uh, national government. I say quasi because, uh, keep in mind, this government under the, under the Articles had no power to tax. I tend to think of the power to tax as one of the essential features of government. If it can't tax, it's not a full-fledged government. Now, what it had to do to get its money was to go to the states with a hat, right, and requisition money, and sometimes the states didn't pay, or they were late, you know, the checks in the mail. And so they, there wasn't a whole lot they could do about it. Some people wanted to send in troops and stuff like that, but the point is that this, this national government could not tax. There was also no separate executive, right? The executive and the Congress were one. The president of the United States, which is what he was called, was a member of Congress. Uh, the other thing that this national government couldn't do was regulate trade. It couldn't tax, so it couldn't impose tariffs, which is, of course, a great way to regulate trade. But it couldn't regulate trade in any other way either. So it had some powers, but you know, it was missing a couple of big ones. The two biggies, tax and trade, were missing, which left the nationalists very unhappy. Now, according to Madison, James Madison, I don't know, libertarians, I guess, aren't wholehearted fans of James Madison, but James Madison's one of those guys that almost everybody likes, except, you know, me and people of my mind. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, he's all, you know, they use his, uh, what, cameo for the, any, for the Federalist Society. I almost said any Federalist Society. On Facebook, I've set up an anti-Federalist Society. The Federalist Society, if you get one of their ties, it's James Madison, right? It's not Adam Smith, it's James, it's James Madison. So uh, Madison, according to his biographer, uh, whose name's Ketchum, Ralph Ketchum, says that, tw and he was a member of the Continental Congress after the, uh, with the when, when the uh, articles took effect, 12 days, okay, less than two weeks after the articles take effect, he is conspiring to find ways to accumulate to increase the power of the national government. In other words, he realized we don't have a lot to work with here. We have no power to tax, and we have no power to regulate trade. Now we have some others, post office, but you know, what can you do with the post office? You know, not a lot to do with it. It's patronage, but you can you know, you could do some things. You could censor the mail, but that, you know, they, 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 that's small scale. That's minor league. They wanted big league stuff. And they were looking for ways, with this language, what can we do? And they were really, you know, they were really stuck. Uh, they thought there's, treaty, there's a treaty power in the Articles. So they thought maybe through treaties we could get powers, right? We, we, we have a treaty with another country which says we can do certain things. Then we can say, well, the treaty says we have to do this. Well, they didn't get too far with that. Uh, a couple times they tried to get a tariff, like a 5% tariff or whatever. But a state always got in the way. Rhode Island for, for, uh, refused to ratify it. Uh, later on, New York and Pennsylvania refused. Once the war ended, uh, the, uh, it really took the pressure off. The state said, well, you don't need the money. The war's over. And th that caused Robert Morris. Robert Morris is one of the bad guys in American history, right? He's, a, he's in the Continental Congress, and he's, he comes up with the Hamilton, basically a Hamiltonian plan. I guess Hamilton, I guess Hamilton was a Morrisonian or Mar Morrisian or whatever. 
uh, central bank, you know, assuming the debt so they could have all this business. He said, it's really too bad the war is ending. I, we were hoping it would last longer so people would get used to paying taxes. He says this. Robert Marsh says this. That's almost a verbatim quotation. Okay? I'm not making this stuff up. So they think we've got to do something. We can't live with this article. This article is a confederation. So what happens? A movement gets going for a constitutional convention. And Philadelphia. Now, the, the, the Continental Congress said, go, you can go and, and modify or amend the articles, and it has to be, any change has to be ratified by 100% of the states, 13 states. Well, they get there and they, tear, they tear up the Articles of Confederation. And they say, no, we're starting over. And that, that caused one of the, later on, when they realized what happened, because they locked, you know, they closed and locked the doors at the convention, couldn't get in. Uh, they made Washington the chairman because he was greatly respected throughout the country, so it gave a nice legitimacy. Uh, one of the anti-federalists later say, if we knew they were going to do that, tear up the articles, just start fresh, we would have never permitted the creation of the convention. One of the big anti-federalists uh, says that. They go to Philadelphia w under the belief that the problem is not too, little, uh, too much government, but too little government. It's a big government move going to Philadelphia. Madison says, the evils suffered and feared from weakness in government have turned the attention toward the means of strengthening government than, than, of, narrowing, than of narrowing it. And James Wilson says, James Wilson, Pennsylvania, a key actor, it has never been a complaint against Congress that they governed over much. The complaint has been that they governed too little. Okay, these are two heavy hitters, okay? These aren't minor figures. Um, and so they rewrite the Constitution. Uh, I don't have time to, to compare the articles, really, to the Constitution, but the comparisons are very, very interesting, very fascinating. For, for example, let's, let's just look at one, uh, one thing here. Um, well, the Commerce Clause, for example. One of the great uh, fairy tales we tell is that the, the main reason for having the Constitutional Convention and the Constitution and for ratifying it is to create a free trade zone, was to create a free trade zone, right? Be why? Because during the eight years of the Articles of Confederation, states had barriers against each other's products. There was, so we didn't have free trade, there wasn't the free flow of goods. Uh, this was creating depression, all kinds of economic problems. And ladies and gentlemen, it's false, it's a myth, it's total nonsense. There was already a free trade zone. You could find one or two examples where Okay, here's an example I get from Jeff ha Jeffrey Rogers Hummel. New Jersey declares its ports duty-free to foreign goods because they want to take business from New York, right? Duty-free, okay, that's, that's free trade, right? New York gets mad and says, okay, European goods coming into New Jersey, if they want to come into New York from there, we'll have to pay a duty. I don't think they just kept them out, but they put a bar barrier. You know, you could find one or two examples like that, which were then inflated by the Federalists, the people promoting the Constitution. It's a whole other issue. Why the guys that wanted a strong central government grabbed the name Federalists, leaving the name Anti-Federalists to the guys that wanted a weak central government. That's a whole other story. Um, the point is there was, a, there was already a free trade zone. In fact, and, the, and further proof of this is in the Federalist, I think it's 84, if uh, I can find the number, uh, Madison, Hamilton complains that if we had a strong central government, we could triple the tariff. The tariffs are too low in the states. They're competing for goods, and they're, they're having the race to the bottom as far as the tariff goes. Hamilton, giving the cartel argument, says, you know, if we formed a cartel of the states, meaning having a strong central government, we could triple the tariff. He says this in The Federalist. So how, do, how can we possibly think the big impetus for the Constitution was to create a free trade zone? when we have, their, we have their own guy saying we could triple the tariff if we have a strong central government. So, more and more stuff like that. Uh, you know, there was no Bill of Rights initially, as you know, and some people in the states said, uh, well, we're not gonna ratify, or we'll ratify, but we want a Bill of Rights, and they proposed a bunch of amendments. And the reason I tell this story is that uh, it, it's, in, it's very revealing of Madison. Uh, once, once the, the, the uh, Constitution was, uh, was uh, ratified, and then the first Congress was set up, uh, a lot of the people that said, okay, yes, once we get in power, we'll give you a Bill of Rights, most of them said, you know what, the hell with the Bill of Rights. We're not going to give many Bill of Rights. Now, Madison got elected to Congress on the promise that, that uh, uh, he would work, you know, to the death for a Bill of Rights. He had to promise that. He wanted to be a member of the Senate. 
but, uh, but the, the legislature of Virginia, that's how they pick senators in those days, put in two anti-federalists instead. So he got rebuffed. So he had to run like a lowly guy in his own congressional district against uh, James Monroe, who was an anti-federalist. He managed to beat Monroe and get into the Congress. So, okay, he says, I'm going to keep my promise. We'll have a Bill of Rights. But he thought it was a terrible idea. He hated it. He, he had some nasty language uh, for the idea of a Bill of Rights. They didn't like having a Bill of Rights. So, in the debates over the Bill of Rights, Madison, they get to what would be eventually become the 10th Amendment. Okay, originally it was the 12th. You know, two didn't make it. There were 12 amendments reported out. Two didn't make it. One had to do with raising pay uh, before, uh, uh, before an election or for the current, you know, for the current uh, Congress. I forget what the other one was offhand. I always forget the other one. But anyway, what became the 10th is the one that uh, constitutional uh, sentimentalists, which includes a lot of libertarians, Jeff Hummel calls them constitutional fetishists, uh, says, you know, that's the key thing. The 10th Amendment today says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited by it to the states or reserved to the states respectively or to the people. When that was being debated, notice it said, I'll read the first couple words again, the power is not delegated to the United States. Well, a heroic man, at least in that context, Thomas Tudor Tucker, member of Congress from South Carolina, rises during the debate in the committee, writing, a, writing this amendment, and says, uh, I make a motion that we, in, we insert the word expressly before the word delegated. The power is not expressly delegated to the United States. Well, one man in particular rose to speak against that amendment. Who might that man be? James Madison. And what does James Madison say? All constitutions must have powers by implication. Now today, if you say to any constitutional sentimentalist, including a lot of libertarians, what do you think of the implied powers doctrine? That's the work of the devil, right? I mean, you always hear Thomas Sowell and people like that rail against the implied powers doctrine. It's the worst thing, right? It makes the Constitution a living Constitution, which Sowell says means it's a dead Constitution, right? A living Constitution, if, if it can change, then it's a dead Constitution. And yet, and what's the, what's the one evil seed? Powers by implication, implied powers. Here is Madison inventing the doctrine. Now, in a sense, he's true. He's right. A constitution would have to have implied powers because he says otherwise you have to have this endless list of minutia, right? You'd have to say every, absolutely everything, which would go on forever. If you have the power to have a post office, you have to also say it also has the power to build post offices, right? And it also has the power to hire people to be postmen. You'd have to specify everything. That's, to me, that's one of the arguments against the Constitution is that by nature, it's going to have implied powers and then it's, you're off to the races, right? It's deuces wild, as Ayn Rand would say. Uh, I must wind down. I'll say one more thing. Uh, there's a, there was language in the Articles of Confederation that sounds similar to this Tenth Amendment where it talked about, but it was very different. The words were, each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the United States in Congress assembled. So it had the word expressly in the articles, and it also had the word retained. And I think it's uh, William Crosskey, a historian, who pointed out that there's a world of difference between retained in the articles and reserved in the Constitution. Of course, it's an amendment to the Constitution. It wasn't in the original one. When you retain something, it's something you already had, but are retaining it. But this, the Constitution says, powers not delegated are reserved to the states. Do you see the nuance there? First of all, it means, okay, well, what powers have been delegated? It has nothing to do with what you had before. Retain means what you had before, you keep. Retain, reserve doesn't have that sense at all. And so this is not the limit that constitutional sentimentalists uh, have thought. Uh, I could go on. I'd love to go on, but uh, there's a schedule to keep. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that the freedom idea was much too far to the actual events on the ground. And that, that we need to teach people that if they, the same reasons they recognize people's right to freedom in their, in their own personal lives apply to the political uh, realm. And that they, they should break down that wall and see that the moral rules are the same. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much.